Um, I think the, the idea for the book really became powerful to me when I learned about the working conditions of stewardesses in the 60s and 70s. Before that, I think like many people, I thought about the golden age of travel as a very Don Draper and Mad Men scenario, you know, <laughs> businessmen, you know, beautiful stewardesses serving them cocktails in first class, maybe slicing roast beef, you know, like an extremely glamorous cosmopolitan sort of scenario. And then when I learned that the flip side of that was maybe the most sexist workplace in America, that these working conditions for women were so difficult, as, as Julie listed earlier, that's when I was like really hooked, you know, it was a story of the labor movement and the feminist movement, two things that I spend a lot of time thinking about. And then to find out that the wins that the flight attendants scored, the ones that I detail in my book, the battles that they fought had like a lasting impact for all working women in America. And that's something that they hadn't gotten any credit for before. I just thought that it was a story that I had to tell. Um, I, I will say right in the introduction of the book, um, there is a phrase that uh, they lost more often than they won. And that was a phrase that uh, was great warning <laughs> when for reading the book, because it can be really frustrating when you hear what um, uh, some of these women went through. And uh, I, I, feel like they must have felt so powerless at times. It was an uphill battle. And as Julie pointed out, um, and as I detail in the book, the flight attendants took every possible tack to, to win rights as workers. They, they went to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and they filed stacks and stacks and stacks of complaints. They went to court, they held hearings, they created you know, uh, stories in the press that journalists would latch onto. And at many, many turns that they were just pulled back in by, by things the company would do, by things even sometimes their union would do. It was just a, a real case of one step forward, two steps back consistently. Um, yeah, when it comes to anything like, oh, you were fired at the eight when you turned 32 and when you finally managed to overturn that rule, the company would sneak in another rule, perhaps a weight limit. Um, so, you know, if you were getting older, you gained a few pounds and you couldn't lose them, oh, sorry, job is gone. So it was absolutely a story of, of many losses. But the fact that the flight attendants managed to win so many victories and that these victories had impact outside you know, the airplane cabin, that they had an impact on, on all working women today, for me is, is even more incredible when you consider the environment that, that they were fighting in. Um, and I, I think that has a lot of impact or a lot of uh, resonance with what's happening you know, today in our country. We're, we're suffering a lot of losses at the moment. You know, we're, we're losing a lot, but I love to think about you know, the circumstances that the women in my book were up against and the fact that they won through, through sheer hard work and solidarity, it, it gives me hope. Sarah, if I can go to you, um, when Nell kind of mentions the, the landscape today, uh, that seems like a good spot for you to talk about what from Nell's book or theme of losses versus wins, what resonates with you um, in today's landscape for flight attendants and can you share some similarities or differences from the history uh, that still exists today in the world? Sure. I, I mean, reading Nell's book um, is a, a little bit like reading your family history. It is so familiar. Uh, I learned by doing. I was uh, hired at United Airlines in 1996. And, and frankly, I only applied for the job because uh, flight attendants, flight attendant unions had just beat back smoking in the workplace. I wouldn't have done it otherwise. Uh, three years earlier, we finally beat back the weight restrictions and made it illegal for um, airlines to have to force us to get on a scale before we would come to work. Um, so these were all conditions that were laid out for me. And someone described the contents of the United Airlines contracts, did not put it in those terms, but talked about the pay and benefits and everything. And that is what encouraged me to go uh, do the job. So I... <laughs> I learned very much um, it, by, by getting involved in the union early on. And I should say my very first day on the job, I uh, walked into the office and there was already an argument between the two senior flight attendants that I was going to be working with. I was assigned to this very senior trip. Uh, the, the flight attendants had between 35 and 40 years uh, seniority between them. Um, so in 1996, think about when they started, uh, really in the core of what Nell is describing and what she just described and what they had been through. And they also um, had very raspy voices because they had been working through a period where they had secondhand smoke in their workplace the entire time. But they, they had this fight with the supervisor and they won. Um, 
so they, but they realized that this may be a little jarring for this brand new flight attendant on her first day, that there had been this conflict in the office even before we started flying. So one of them pulled me aside and in an attempt to help <laughs> said to me, um, now listen, management thinks of us as their wives or their mistresses. And in either case, they hold us in contempt. And I'm like, woo, that's a lot to take in at 23, fresh out of company training. Um, but what she, what she said next was comforting. She said, your only place of worth is with your fellow flying partners. And if we stick together, you wear your union pin, there's nothing we can't accomplish. And so there was that, there was that hook of hope for me. And also this message of solidarity that um, uh, felt, um, felt good. Um, and felt like something that I wanted to be a part of right away. And it wasn't until later, and actually until I became very much more involved in the union, that I understood just how right she was about the level of contempt that was held for flight attendants by management, a very sexist um, level of contempt, um, and, and all of the objectification uh, that went on with flight attendants that I, I had to get involved in right away in my union work fighting, fighting, fighting every single day just to be able to get to the table, just to be able to get recognized and, and understanding that the women who fought before me gave me this uh, mentorship in that space um, to say that no one's going to give you a space at the table. We're, we're going to do that together. We're always going to fight together. And so I always had hope because we had this women-led union, this flight attendant only union, which, which frankly is sort of anathema to the idea of the labor movement of one big union, all workers working together. But it was these women who fought for uh, APFA and also AFA breaking away from male dominated unions in both cases to have our own space, our own ability to fight forward and um, demand that flight attendants be heard and demand that um, our, our careers be defined. And I really picked up right at the point where, they, where the people who came before me had turned what had been a job that was not only uh, heavy discrimination, but objectified and used to sell airline tickets um, into a career. Uh, and we had to take it forward, but absolutely, I mean, it was, it's always a slug. Um, to just get to the table, get recognized, um, fight for, through all the discrimination that would say that your voice doesn't matter, you're cast aside, you're marginalized, but we had hope and we had power because women came together and, and just demanded to get results. And uh, shout out to Pat Gibbs, who is the number one heroine in the book, um, and I believe is watching right now. And thanks to Pat and all of her contemporaries who made it this possible for us to have this career today thing that I would say is thanks to all the women who uh, launched the Me Too movement, because that was a moment where not only were we able to take the certification that we fought hard to win, the right to um, have minimum staffing on the airplane so they can, planes cannot take off with pilots, but they also cannot take off without, without flight attendants. And um, so we fought for our place in this industry, but with the Me Too movement, it was a moment where we could actually talk about what it's really like on the job, what that sexism has been like. And we called out airline management and said, it is time once and for all for you to denounce this industry's sexist past, to hold up flight attendants as safety professionals, and to declare that there's zero tolerance for this kind of behavior in the workplace. And I have to say that was a moment where for the first time we were actually able to really tell our stories and go beyond what I experienced on that first day on the job where the flight attendant told me that no one was ever gonna have our backs. No one was ever going to listen to us or make space for us, but we could do that together. We could make space together. And suddenly this opened up for us to be really seen as leaders um, and, and to move away and get respect in our own right for the work that we do. And so I think at this point, we fly to every corner of the earth when some people can only dream of crossing borders today. We have access, more access to the public than almost anyone. When something happens on the plane, when there's a noise on the plane, the public turns to us and looks to us for leadership. And I think that that's a great metaphor for where we are actually in society and how we actually can tell the story of women today and what it means to be working women who are flying from state to state, who when they touch down in certain states, they have different rights today. And that's, that's simply not acceptable. It's not acceptable that even before the decision on Dodd, that when we land in this country, we step off a plane that doesn't recognize us in this country as equal. 
done with that. So flight attendants have a responsibility today to show the rest of working people who are saying that they're very interested in being in a union, but maybe don't see themselves there because they've always seen union members as someone with a hard hat and a tool belt, that we can actually show people that it's anyone who works, who can join a union, build that power in their workplace, take on capitalism, and actually build an inclusive society that works in a democracy that is also a, a capitalism, but with checks on it, because working people are able to hold that capital accountable and bring some of the profits back to all of us. I think flight attendants have that, that leadership role right now um, that we can promote forward. Um, and we have a tremendous responsibility to do that. And we have a tremendous opportunity to do that. And uh, we're gonna be able to have even greater footing when Delta flight attendants join our union too. So just to capture that, so the, the vision is, isn't just, you know, um, like kind of insular, insular airline thing. Like you, you, when you, when I hear you talk, it's like, it's, it's everything, it's everyone, it's all the labor movements. It's, it's kind of society and culture. Um, that's where you help the role in the movement is going. A hundred percent, Julie. And just to take on the issue of healthcare, we spend three quarters of our time at the table fighting on for health care in our contracts just to hang on to what we negotiated decades ago. This is slipping away um, further and further because for-profit health care companies have a chokehold on that industry. And the only way that's going to change is if we organize in the tens of millions right now, flight attendants have to lead on that. So I can't even take on the issues that my members care about if I'm not backing up Starbucks workers and Amazon workers and any worker who's looking for a union right now, because we have to have the ability to tackle our management with these issues across the board and then go with management, with that capital to take on the for-profit healthcare companies because no individual company is willing to take on those for-profit healthcare companies. But if we demand that as labor across the board, hold all of our companies accountable, and we do that together, we can actually win on that issue. And that's a big issue that my members care about very much. And I can't even begin to take it on if I don't support other workers organizing right now. Um, so can you give us a little bit of background on exactly what Delta flight attendants are thinking about or working towards and tell us about the efforts you and your colleagues are putting your focus on to get there? Yes, we are, um, of course, working towards unionizing over 22,000 flight attendants uh, currently across the country in several different bases. And I just wanted to give you all um, an idea of the scope of what we're doing. This will be one of the largest organizing efforts in modern labor and history. Um, so it's a seems like an insurmountable task, but we're ready to tackle it head on. And some of the things that we're doing is um, we are, we've got something that we call visibility, where we sit in our flight attendant lounges and we let people know that uh, the other flight attendants that we're organizing. And that's, um, with 22,000 flight attendants, it's hard to reach everyone, of course. So we're trying to make sure that we talk to each person find out what's important to them. And it's not just about talking to them, it's also about reclaiming our space and getting over that fear of getting in trouble for unionizing that, hey, this is our right, this is our space, and we're here to do this. And also um, speaking to something else that we've never done before, being part of the conversation, we're getting the public involved. We're talking to other people um, in other unions and other, workplaces that are unionizing like Starbucks, we're finding so much solidarity across the labor movement. And I thank Sarah for that. That is new to our campaign. And it's um, just changed the way that everyone sees what we're doing, um, every, how everyone sees us, that we're you know, safety professionals, that we're working um, hard towards something. It, much like in the book, um, women fought hard to be seen as not just um, sex objects or cocktail waitresses that were safety professionals, that were workers, that were a part of this labor movement. So talking to other workers across industries, talking to the public, talking to our passengers who are actually rooting us on, who are saying, hey, you know, go you guys, you know what, we hope you get your union because they see how hard we work, especially during the pandemic um, when we were um, fighting for um, to have gloves and masks and to be able to wear them on the airplane. Um, it wasn't just about our safety, but we care about our passengers as well. If we unionize and take care of us, we're able to take care of the passengers because that's absolutely what we want to do. 
So yeah, we're on the ground. We are working hard and just trying to bring awareness to our work group and the public. And we value so much support um, that everyone's been giving us. So yeah, it's hard work, but um, it's fun. And we thank you guys for you know allowing us to speak and tell our story. You know, Julie, I think that Nell's book is extraordinary in this moment for so many reasons. I mean, <laughs> I love it because it's, of course, directly related to the work that I do. But I think it's so instructional for uh, where we are in this moment because um, there are so many social issues to take on and uh, groups that have been formed specifically to take on those social issues. This is something that Nell addresses in the book. Um, and, but the power is in the unions and the lasting lock-in and the ability to uh, make improvements in laws, whether that's you know, just a, a legally binding contract or a change in legislation that changes um, the overall rights for people or the benefits or access to benefits um, and the enforcement of that contract and enforcement of those laws. Um, we, we fought hard, for example, for whistleblower protection so that um, we can call out safety issues in the work. If you don't have a union to back you up as a worker when you're a whistleblower, um, you may have those laws that protect you, um, but you may have to hire a private attorney and fight for many years because the, the companies can retaliate against you and hope to just um, wait you out as a worker and, and drown you out in, in legal bills. So if there's not a union there to protect that and protect all the gains that we've made, it can just get washed away. And what is described so perfectly in the book is the realization and the recognition of these um, activists who were feminists, who were pushing forward and against sexism, but who understood that the real power was taking on capital, was taking on um, uh, money and the corporate elite in a capitalist society so that we can put them in check, hold them accountable. And, and that's where our power lies to make real difference, a real difference. And that's the connection that needs to be made for the public today. And it's something that flight attendants, it's a message that flight attendants can give to the public and help them understand, you know, this is how you lock in the gains. This is how you have real power. This is how you come together and actually make it count and make it stick. Um, and, and it is so beautifully told, but it's, it's a fight that is never ending. Um, and it continues on today. And if we organize in, in the tens of millions right now, uh, we can lock that in and lock in real changes and lock in civic engagement and, and lock in our democracy. And that's why this book is so, um, uh, so instructional, of course, for every flight attendant out there. And we're actually gonna buy <laughs> a big bulk from Nell and, and make her arm sore from signing books um, <laughs> because this needs to get into the hands of so, all of our activists and all of our staff and everyone. Um, but it's instructional for anyone who wants to form a union today and why they should and who, who those union members are. And the other thing that she calls out so well in the book is that flight attendants are a great ambassador for the labor movement because we can move in and out of a lot of spaces that other people can never get into and um, to be at tables easily. Um, and, and we also, um, people look to us for that leadership. So we're already built in in a space to be able to share this message and to be able to show a different view of who union members are and how power is built. With the small victories uh, piling up is that you, um you don't quit after a loss and then you don't stop after a win. You just keep going and going and going until those small uh, victories just stack up and they become big wins. Going back to our hair issue um, with the Afros being, um, not even being accepted in the workplace to now we're able to wear our natural hair in the workplace. However, in our uniform standards, uh, it can't be wider than the width of our shoulders. So, so here we are. We, we won a little bit. We lost something. But now, you know, we know that we still need to push forward. We're not going to stop there. So once that we're able to wear our natural hair the way it grows out of our head <laughs> at whatever length, um, maybe that person who, um, who wears a hijab, they will, be, they will feel empowered to apply to the airlines and be able to wear their hijab at work. You know, it's just taking those little things and stacking them on top of each other. And that just uh, speaks to the larger work that we're doing within the labor movement um, as a whole. 
But again, it's just that <laughs> resilience, that persistence, the perseverance that was pervasive throughout the book. Um, it's just something that we have to carry on throughout our fights with, um, with our companies, with unionization and the larger labor movement and what's going on in the country as a whole. Like we experienced some, experienced a lot of losses uh, these past few weeks, but we're not gonna stop there. We're gonna take those and use that to propel us forward, to bring more energy and to fight whatever comes our way. One thing I wanna leave everyone with is that flight attendant C is that actually we are not a divided society. We see everyone from all kinds of backgrounds come on our plane, all kinds of humanity jammed in together. And you would think that that is a recipe for a complete disaster every single time. And the reality is that flight attendants do a great job of de-escalation. They do a great job of leading people through a peaceful process. But most people come to the door of our airplane with a desire for a safe and eventful flight. And we have to lift that up and recognize that this society actually craves solidarity. And we know that as flight attendants. So as much as we will report to you that we still need your help and we need you to be helpers on the plane, put your phone down, recognize us when you come on board, say hello, make that eye contact, let us know that we have someone who has our back on this flight. That's very helpful. Um, but I also want you to know that what we actually experience is that society is much more united than anyone would have us believe. And that we actually see um, some of the best in humanity on our planes too. And we want to report that out too and not let that get lost in the mix here. There's way more people who want to do good, who want to come together, who want to uh, join together and, and make sure that everyone has a safe and uneventful flight than there are people who want to disturb it. Um, should we as female union leaders, past and present, um, take on remaining obstacles within the AFL um, CIO, and I'm I'm curious if you have thoughts on that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have lots of thoughts on that. <laughs> um, Two minutes worth of thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, okay, um, absolutely we have to fight through that. Um, we cannot be irrelevant as a labor movement. And I think that um, you know, when you have, <laughs> when you allow this system to continue to be led um, by people who have been in the positions for a very long time, been removed from the workforce for a very long time, um, not necessarily had to struggle through the same things that we have had to struggle through as uh, women workers, women leaders uh, within the labor movement, um, that there can be incredible inertia, which I think is, is where we are. We could, uh, we could really, I mean, 13 million union members is nothing to sneeze at. And um, activating those 13 million union members to talk about why they love their union and, and engage in the communities in that way uh, is an incredible um, opportunity for us to you know, turn on. Um, I think that what we have to do is we have to continue to challenge, um, you know, basically the, the, the white men who are still kind of in charge. Uh, we need to abolish women's committees. Our issues are not side issues. Women's issues are workers' issues. We need to bring those central. Uh, we need to bring issues from every marginalized community central to the labor movement. We need to lift up who labor really is. Um, and so, yes, we need to challenge that every single day, but we also need to challenge that not just um, by running into rooms and telling everyone how they're doing it wrong, um, but leading um, by getting results. And so, you know, I, I, I have work to do as a union leader to show how you can get results um, when you're empowering people and um, making this a worker-led movement. Um, where we continue to organize, where we continue to engage people, where we continue to look for people who are not being represented today and lifting them up as leaders and encouraging them to get involved. 